Hey everyone, welcome to a short video recap of five hot takes that I, I really enjoyed about episode two of Amazon Prime's Wheel of Time television show. In this episode, we finally get to see the opening sequence of the show, and that, uh, it was fantastic. Like, we, there's all kinds of Easter eggs hidden there. It's going to require an entire segment in and of itself to, to, to really dive into it, but I just want to give a couple of quick tidbits of what I really liked about it. For people who have read the books, you'll get a feeling of the age lace of the Wheel of Time. In, in the books, the Wheel of Time is a physical thing, like it's tangible. Um, it's theorized that, you know, somewhere in some dimension, it, you could touch it like it's there. And each thing, everything, in the entirety of the world in existence has a thread in that pattern. In the opening sequence, we see a, a thread being pulled and pulled and pulled almost to its breaking point and then the camera cuts before it actually breaks so like you know they might be kind of hinting at something like the pattern is fraying and almost breaking and then you know it might break but who knows and then the next thing it cuts to is colored threads being woven in a loom which is again another theorized look for what the wheel of time looks and how the age lace gets woven at first you can't really see what the pattern is. It looks almost kind of like a topographical map at first. You see like greens looking like fields and small golden areas looking like mountains or hills. But then you see that an image starts to form and the images that you see are seven Aes Sedai, seven women who are Aes Sedai, represented as the seven Ajas. So they're, you know, the seven different colors and each woman is a little different. They have things going on. You know, some, uh, the green is holding like a rod, which could be an angrel, turangrel, sangrel, something like that. Maybe even a weapon. The red, you don't really get a good look at, but kind of looks a little judgmental, <laughs> which, you know, is on par for the reds. The brown is holding a book and looking quizzical, which is, you know, right on track for them. The yellows look almost holy. It's a, it's a little, like, I get feelings of like Christianity from them. So, you know, healing, holy magic, maybe, I don't know. The whites and the grays both look very similar. They're kind of staring off to the side and um, they look like almost lost in thought, which is, you know, right online with them. Diplomats, you know, hard thinkers, stuff like that. And the blues are very similar to the grays. They are, you know, standing proud, you know, chest out and strong looking, which is kind of what the, you know, the blues are all about. They're all about, you know, taking a stand for something. So all in all, I really enjoyed the opening sequence. We get to see it for the first time in episode two. Absolutely fantastic. So then the, the show goes directly into an interesting juxtaposition between, you know, the beauty of the shot and the shot that you get to see here is absolutely fantastic. It's a beautiful meadow or green, very stark, clean, white tents. The servants' livery is all very clean. The soldiers all very pristine armor, very pristine clothing. And it goes into one of the servants, a, a young child, carrying a covered dish. They place it in front of a man who we will later learn is Iman Valda, played by the amazing Abdul Salas. And Abdul here, like, absolutely amazing. You know, he's sitting at this table, he gets served this covered dish, and he opens it up, and it's this small looking, it almost looks like a slug with needles coming out of it. But what it actually is, is a small songbird. I'm pretty sure. Uh, the way he talks about it really reminds me of a, of a thing that I know from another show, which really sets the tone for the rest of the White Cloak interaction for probably ever. Now, in the books, the White Cloaks are kind of like the bunt of a joke. Uh, when we first are introduced to them, they're buffoonish. You know, Matt plays a joke on them in Barillon. He rolls a barrel down the street. They get dirty. Moraine is, isn't very afraid of them. She talks about them as maybe more of a nuisance and like, you know, someone to just, you know, maybe kind of worry about, but they're just more annoying than they are threatening 
in the show, they seem to be really dialing that up to a, a thousand on how threatening they are to the Aes Sedai and the party and just uh, how much we're supposed to hate them. Amazon did everything short of just having Abdul or Eamon Valda murder a puppy on screen to make us hate him in this first few minutes of this episode. So we have a yellow sister staked to a pole. Her hands are cut off so that she can't channel because the Aes Sedai are taught like that, you know, hand motions for channeling, which I'll get into in a whole nother segment on how I feel about that. I like it, and it really lends the idea to different kind of channeling happening throughout the series. Maybe people don't use their hands and whatever, but I really like what they're doing there if they explore that storyline. He is talking to her. He even says that the brutal killing that he's doing to this uh, yellow sister is a mercy, is good. Oh my God, you just hate him, like, and you're terrified of him right off the bat. It gives me serious Dolores Umbridge vibes for our Harry Potter fans. Now he takes a ring off of the severed hand, which is now we know the Aes Sedai rings, and hangs it from this like serial killer-esque trophy hook from his belt, where he's got all of the Aes Sedai that he's murdered on his hanging from this like little hook thing on his belt that's all the rings. Fantastic scene, like the cinematography there, the, um, the music, the sound effect, everything was just chilling, it was absolutely chilling. Like it evokes the exact response that they want, at least for me, and I'm sure for most of you, perfectly done to set the tone of what I think they want from the White Cloaks. Now I wanna spend just a little bit more time on the White Cloaks because we see them again, which gives us a really stark contrast between this first scene, and then when our party encounters them in the forest. So Lan picks up that there's white cloaks, he comes back and warns Moraine, Moraine takes her ring off, Lan hides it, and then they interact with the white cloaks. Bornhold is there, and he seems almost fatherly, very nice, like they do, and like they describe in the books. He's, he's cordial, he's respectful, he seems, like I said, like nice, like, oh, maybe the white cloaks all aren't bad. And then, Eamon Valda comes up again and jingles those rings to like let Bornhold know he's there. And then Bornhold seems to defer to, to Eamon Valda. So now Bornhold is the captain commander of the area. He's very high ranking in the White Cloaks within the books and it seems like within the show as well. He is essentially a field general for the White Cloaks. Eamon Valda is a questioner. Now he's a high ranking questioner but the questioners kind of exist outside of the White Cloaks at the same time of being part of them. They think of themselves as above all of the White Cloaks, even though Lord Captain Commander in, in that sense. So either what's happening here is Bornhold is playing a part. He's playing the good cop, Eamon Vald is playing the bad cop, and he's fully aware of what's going on and supports Eamon in what he's doing. Or Amazon is trying to show that there is even a little bit of conflict within the White Cloak army or within the White Cloak ranks. Abdul questions them, they let them go, and Abdul says, I will remember your face. Bah, 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 bah. Which then in a later scene, Moiraine will say, he's not the only one that will remember a face today because of the, you know, the rings. The White Cloaks are really played up to being a much more substantial threat. They were much more buffoonish in the books than they seem to be being portrayed in the show. Okay, so now my next hot take here is Moraine. I mean, she's really showcased a lot in this episode if you could pick up on her the subtle things that she's doing. So Maureen is the Blue Aja. A lot of what they represent in the books is taking a stance for something and having a cause about something. But something else they're also very good at is secrets and manipulation. Now, like, that's all this I said I are good at that. But the Blue in particular, and Maureen especially, is <laughs> is... Wow, just like, it's like, a, she's like an artist, the way she manipulates people. Which is, you know, it's not a bad thing, that's what the Aes I have to do to get the job done. They are, in some cases, the best people for the job, and some people can't be told, like, hey, listen, you have to listen to me. They need to be led that way. And she's masterful at that. She started setting it up immediately when she walks into that tavern in episode one. She gives them the all. Oh, it's an I said, I. We never seen an I said, I. You know, they're in a small town, and then immediately starts to build on that. Now, given some of the circumstances, kind of force her to that with you know channeling like a complete badass that she is. But I digress. In this episode, she really drives home that stake to manipulating the Emmons fielders, to doing what she wants, ultimately. Now, 
She started that in the first episode, like I said, but one of the real poignant things here is there's a scene where our Emmonsfield four at this point, because Nynaeve is not there, are singing a song. And the song is about Manetherin, which is the ancient city that was located where the two rivers in Amon's Field is now. It was destroyed in the Trolloc Wars. She tells the story about that. They feel a connection to her now. So like they, they're starting to trust her. Oh, she's so knowledgeable. And they, she tells her about this thing that we've known our whole life, this song that we sung about Manetherin and they know nothing about it. And then she comes in and says, well, Manetherin and the story. And it's, it's fantastic. Like, first of all, Rosamund Pike, I've said it a million times and I will say it a bajillion more times. I love her. She is amazing. Her character portrayal of Moraine is perfect. Moraine is my favorite character. She's been my favorite character. Team Moraine for life. And I love her portrayal of this character throughout the whole series. So her rendition of the Manetheran story, yet delivered at a different time in the show than it was in the books, is just as impactful with these characters. Now, in the books, it does endear her to the entire town because the entire town gets that same kind of thing. Like, oh, man, I didn't know any of that. But not really important because, you know, in the books, Moiraine never goes back. So in here, it's important for her to endear herself to them. And that's exactly what happens with this story. She then uses that relationship immediately to start to drive a, not, maybe not drive a wedge on purpose, but start to pull Egwene into her, where she wants her to be, which is an Aes Sedai. So she wakes her up in the middle of the night, like she does in the books, and is teaching her how to use the One Power. The way she describes opening the power to her is akin to how the woman's circle ceremony worked in the first episode. Either that is just coincidence because, you know, the ceremonial rituals that carried over throughout all of the women's groups in the world kind of are built around the one power and how women use the one power, which could be, you know, because it's been 3,000 years, one power was everywhere, Manatharan was, was ruled by a queen who was an Aes Sedai, or, which, and this is the thing that I think it, it is, Moiraine, while she was in the Two Rivers, asked enough questions to learn about the women's circle initiation and used terminology that would be familiar to Egwene when she was teaching her to open the One Power. Another thing about the One Power is that it's addictive. It is amazing to use. Like, when you open yourself to it and you feel it flowing through you, it's powerful. You feel powerful. It's described almost like an addictive drug in the books. And once you start using it, you don't want to stop, which is why men being cut off from the One Power is so detrimental to them because even though it's tainted, when they get cut off from it, they don't want to live anymore. So in this scene, it's almost like Moraine is giving Egwene her first taste of the One Power and then going, oh, well, now you have to come to the White Tower and learn. And that's exactly, in the books, that's exactly what happened. She's really starting to try to get into that group and build those relationships with them. She doesn't do a great job with the boys right off. They are immediately mistrustful of her, uh, even in the first episode, immediately following when she just kills an entire group of Trollocs. She heals Tam and then Rand immediately accuses her of, like, it's her fault that the Trollocs came. So, like, they, they have a mistrust of her, but at the same time, they listen. When they wake up in the morning from having slept where they had horrible nightmares about Balmazan, which I'll get to in a minute, she is fed up with their nonsense because Rand confronts her again and she rides off. They listen to her. They get on their horses and they ride after her. Matt is even the one who's like, listen, my lady throws fireballs out of her hands. We should probably be listening to her. And it's a great scene. Matt offers a lot of levity in these first few episodes that is not anywhere else. And it's, it's good. It's good. I like it. We get our first look at Balmazan here. Now, we did see him in some of the teasers that they released. They released that 360 teaser and there was like, you know, a face in like the smoky thing that was supposed to represent uh, Sidene or Sidar or just the one power or whatever. But here we get to see Balmazan, full frontal Balmazan, head to toe, hood, cloak, fiery eyes, looking like he's wearing a mask. And man, it does a great job. Like, what is this person? Like, what's going on here? Is it uh, another shadow spawn? You know, it's not an unhuman-like face, flaming eyes and mouth. Like, what's going on here? 
book readers have an idea, but you know, they could be changing stuff, so we don't know. This is another really interesting thing that the storytellers use to kind of push the Emmons Fielders toward Moiraine. You know, they're afraid of this thing that's happening to them. Moiraine's an Aes Sedai, she knows about this stuff. We need to stay close to her, to, at the very least, to figure out what the hell's going on with us. We get the disgustingness of Rand pulling a literal dead bat from his throat and then throwing it on the floor. And when he wakes up in the morning, that bat looking exactly the way it did when he threw it on the floor is sitting there on the floor and it's disgusting. There's dead bats everywhere. This is akin to the scene in Berlon when there were all the dead rats all over the inn in the morning. And then in the show, a Merdral shows up. So like that's, that's kind of what happens here. And then they get chased into Shatter Logoth. Now this is a five hot take uh, thing here. So I'm not going to get into Shatter Logoth in this one. We're going to probably talk all about it in our live stream and we'll maybe even dedicate probably an entire segment to it because there's a lot that's going on in Shatter Logoth. There's a lot of changes from the books which are done well. I'm perfectly fine with them. And there are a lot of little Easter eggy type things that are going on that I'd be interested in diving into. But the fifth thing that I want to focus on that is accentuated more in the scenes in Shadow Logoth is the relationship between Rand, Matt, and Perrin. Now there's a very platonic love between these three and I really appreciate the way they're depicting it. In episode one we get the, you know, they're pals, they're buddies, they gamble together, they drink together, they're in the inn. And then we get a little bit of the, you know, like we're best friends, we care about each other when it's, you know, Perrin and Rand obviously talked, Matt doesn't have any money, let's get him some money so that he can buy stuff for his sisters. Now in this episode, we have a scene where it's Perrin is sitting off alone and Matt comes and sits with him and he takes out a dagger and is holding it in his hand, twisting it around and he tells Perrin that this dagger was made by Layla, Perrin's wife who didn't exist in the books, but for storytelling purposes and to make us feel a certain way about Perrin and to pick Perrin's character in a certain way they invented for the show, which I think they did a wonderful job with. And he says, Layla gave this to me. She wanted me to have this because she knew one day I was going to need to protect you with it. And now I'm giving it to you. So Matt is doing this as like, I'm protecting you by giving this to you. It's like, I'm giving you a piece of your wife back, something that she made for me to protect you with, and now that's part of you again. So, like, Matt is fulfilling that promise here by protecting his emotional well-being by linking Perrin to his wife through this dagger now. Matt also obviously cares about Perrin, like, he cares enough to notice that he's upset, he comes over, he sits next to him, they, they do this thing, and it's, it's not only Perrin's wife recognizing this close relationship between Matt and Perrin and knowing that if she gave this to Matt, Matt would take care of Perrin, but Matt fulfilling it. And it's it's just a great interpersonal relationship that they're doing with these men that you don't really get to see in fantasy settings like this. You know, men are always gruff and rough with each other and everyone needs to, you know, just be tough. And in this one, the characters just seem a lot more real. And this kind of nurturing side of Matt is the like redemption side. You know, he's a thief, he's a petty thief, he's a gambler, but he also deeply cares for the people that he loves. That's my five hot takes for episode two of Amazon's Wheel of Time TV show. If you like them, post some comments. If you didn't like them, post some comments too. Any interaction is good interaction. Let me know if there are other hot takes that you wish I talked about, and maybe we'll you know, do a segment on them in a later episode. All right, see y'all later. And that's our show. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. And as always, subscribe, give us a like, a thumbs up, leave us a positive comment. And if you have any friends that enjoy the Wheel of Time, send them over some of our links. I'm sure they'd love to see some new information. Also, a huge thank you to our sponsor, Tor Books, as well as our fantabulous Patreon community. If you are wanting to know more about how this show is made or some other Wheel of Time insights, join our Patreon. You can get some more information, as well as follow Dragon Mail on social media. Until next time, we are the Wheel of Time Community Show. Thank you. Goodbye.